Hello. Hello, my lovely Patreon. How are we doing today? I hope you are doing absolutely fabulous. It's Jaxi back with a little video for you all. Today I'm going to be reading an excerpt of Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. This is an amazing book. It's like the thickness of the Bible. Uh, not really, but it's long and I've been slowly getting through it. But yeah, it's about how women are our wild woman spirit and she uses allegory and stories to talk about psychology in women. I love it. So I'm gonna do a little reading excerpt of that, but first I wanna show you my shirt. This is available right now as we speak on jacksyshop.com. Um, my prices are really affordable there, guys. And I did, I cut this t-shirt, it took like five minutes. And I made a little tutorial on how to cut it. If you like the look of this um, shirt with little bows here. But check it out. I just added some new designs and I'm getting, I feel like every design I add is cuter than the last one. And I'm getting a bit better at it. So, take, take a look. All right, we're on chapter eight. It's called Self-Preservation, Identifying Leg Traps, Cages, and Poisoned Bait. The Feral Woman. In the Oxford English Dictionary, the word feral derives from Latin fur, meaning wild beast. In common usage, a feral creature is one who was once wild, then domesticated, and who has reverted back to a natural or untamed state once again. I postulate that the feral woman as I postulate the feral woman as one who was once in a natural psychic state, that is, in her rightful wild mind, then later captured by whatever turn of events, thereby becoming overly domesticated and deadened in proper instincts. When she has opportunity to return to her original wildish nature, she too easily steps into all manner of traps and poisons. Because her cycles and protective systems have been tampered with, she is at risk in what used to be her natural wild state. No longer wary and alert, she easily becomes prey. There is a specific pattern to the loss of instinct. It is essential to study this pattern to actually memorize it so that we can guard the treasures of our basic natures and those of our daughters as well. In the psychic woods, there are many legs, leg traps made of rusted iron that lie just below the leafy green of the forest floor. Psychologically, the same is true of the greater world. There are various lures to which we are susceptible, relationships, people, and ventures that are tempting but inside that good-looking bait is something sharpened to a point, something that kills our spirit as soon as we bite into it. Feral women of all ages, and especially the young, have a tremendous drive to compensate for long famines and exiles. They are endangered by excessive and mindless striving toward people and goals that are not nurturant, substantive, or enduring. No matter where they live or in what time, there are cages waiting always. Two small lives into which women can be lured or pushed. If you have ever been captured, if you have ever endured hambre del alma, a starvation of the soul, if you have ever been trapped, and especially if you have a drive to create, it is likely that you have been or are a feral woman. The feral woman is usually extremely hungry for something soulful and often will take any poison disguised on a pointed stick, believing it to be the thing for which her soul hungers. Though some feral women veer away from traps at the last moment with only minor losses of fur, far more stumble into them unwittingly, knock temporarily senseless while others are broken by them and still others manage to, 
disentangle themselves and drag themselves off to a cave to nurse their injuries alone. In order to avoid these snares and enticements that are tripped by a woman's time spent in capture and famine, we must be able to see caution. Oh, we must be able to see them in advance and sidestep them. We have to redevelop insight and caution. We have to learn to veer. To be able to see the right turns, we have to be able to see the wrong ones. There is what I believe to be the remnants of an old woman's teaching tale that explicitly explicates the plight of the starved and feral woman. It is variously known by names such as the Devil's Dancing Shoes, the Red Hot Shoes of the Devil, and the Red Shoes. Hans Christian Andersen wrote this rendition of this old tale and titled it with the latter name. Like a true raconteur, he surrounded the, the core of the story with much of his own ethnic wit and sensitivity. The following is a Magyar Germanic version of the Red Shoes that my Aunt Teresa used to tell us when we were children. One that I use here with her blessing. In her artful way, she always began the tale by saying, look at your shoes and be, thank and be thankful they are plain. For one has to live very carefully if one's shoes are too red. Here's the story, the Red Shoes. Once there was a poor motherless child who had no shoes, but the child saved clo cloth scraps wherever she found them, and over time sewed herself a pair of red shoes. They were crude, but she loved them. They made her feel rich, even though her days were spent gathering food in the thorny woods until far past dark. But one day, as she trudged down the road in her rags and her red shoes, a gilded carriage pulled up beside her. Inside was an old woman who told her she was going to take her home and treat her as her own little daughter. So to the wealthy old woman's house they went and the child's hair was cleaned and combed. She was given pure white undergarments and a fine wool dress and white stockings and shiny black shoes. When the child asked after her old clothes and especially her red shoes, the old woman said the clothes were so filthy and the shoes are so ridiculous that she had thrown them into the fire where they burnt to, sh to ashes. The child was very sad for even with all the riches surrounding her, the humble red shoes made by her own hands had given her the greatest happiness. Now she was made to sit still all the time, to walk without skipping and to not speak unless spoken to, but a secret fire began to burn in her heart and she continued to yearn for her old red shoes more than anything. As the child was old enough to be confirmed on the day of the innocence, the old woman took her to an old crippled shoemaker to have a special pair of shoes made for the occasion. In the shoemaker's case, there stood a pair of red shoes, shoes made of finest leather that were finer than fine. They practically glowed. So even though red shoes were scandalous for church, the child who chose only with her hungry heart picked the red shoes. The old lady's eyesight was so pure she could not see the color of the, the shoes and so she paid for them. The old shoemaker winked at the child and wrapped the shoes up. The next day, the church members were agog over the shoes on the child's feet. The red shoes shone like burnished apples, like hearts, like red washed plums. Everyone stared, even the icons on the wall. Even the statues stared disapprovingly at her shoes but she loved the shoes all the more. So when the pointiff intoned, the choir hummed and the, the organ pumped, the child thought nothing more beautiful than her red shoes. By the end of the day, the old woman had been informed about her, her ward's red shoes. Never, never wear those red shoes again, the old woman threatened. But the next Sunday, the child couldn't help but choose the red shoes over the black ones. And she and the old woman walked to church as usual. At the door to the church was an old soldier with his arm in a sling. He wore a little jacket and had a red beard. He bowed and asked permission to brush the dust from the child's shoes. The child put out her foot and he tapped the soles of her shoes with a little wig a jig jig song that made the soles of her feet itch. Remember to stay for the dance, he smiled and winked at her. 
Again, everyone looked sconce at the girl's red shoes. But she so loved those shoes that were bright like crimson, bright like raspberries, bright like pomegranates, that she could hardly think of anything else, hardly hear the service at all. So busy was she turning her feet this way and that, admiring her red shoes that she forgot to sing. As she and the old woman left the church, the injured soldiers called out, what beautiful dancing shoes. His words made the girl take a few little twirls right there and then, but once her feet had begun to move, they would not stop. And she danced through the flower beds and around the corner of the church until it seemed as though she had lost complete control of herself. She did a gavit and then a sardal, and then waltzed by herself through the fields across the way. The old woman's coachman jumped from his bench and ran after the girl, picked her up and carried her back to the carriage. But the girl's feet and the red shoes were still dancing in the air as though she was still on the ground. The old woman and the coachman tugged and pulled, trying to pry the red shoes off. It was such a sight, all hats askew and kicking legs, but at last the child's feet were calm. Back home, the old woman slammed the red shoes down on a high shelf and warned the girl never to touch them again. The girl could not help looking at them and longing for them. To her, they were still the most beauteous things on the face of the earth. Not long after, as fate would have it, the old woman became, became bedridden. And as soon as her doctors left, the girl crept into the room where the red shoes were kept. She glanced up at them so high on the shelf, her glance became a gaze and her gaze became a powerful desire. So much so that the girls took the shoes from the shelf and fastened them on, feeling it would do no harm. But as soon as, she, as soon as they touched her heels and toes, she was overcome by the urge to dance. And so out the door she danced and then down the steps, first in a gavit, then a sardaw, and then in big daring waltz, turns in rapid succession. The girl was in her glory and did not realize she was in trouble until she wanted to dance to the left and the shoes insisted on dancing to the right. When she wanted to dance around, the shoes insisted on dancing straight ahead. And as the shoes danced, the girl rather, as this, and as the shoes danced the girl, rather than the other way around, they danced her right down the road, through the muddy fields and out into the dark and gloomy forest. There against a tree was the old soldier with the red beard, his arm in a sling and dressed in his little jacket. Oh my, he said, what beautiful dancing shoes. Terrified, she, pulled, she tried to pull the shoes off, but as much as she tugged, the shoes stayed fast. She hopped on one foot and then the other, trying to take off the shoes, but her one foot on the ground kept dancing even so, and her other foot in her hand did its part of the dance also. And so dance and dance and dance she did, over highest hills and through the valleys, in the rain and in the snow and in the sunlight, she danced. She danced in the darkest night and through the sunrise and she was still dancing in twilight as well. But it was not good dancing, it was terrible dancing and there was no rest for her. She danced into a churchyard and there a spirit of dread would not allow her to enter. The spirit pronounced these words over her. You shall dance in your red shoes until you become like a wrath like a ghost, till your skin hangs from your bones, till there is nothing left of you but entrails dancing. You shall dance door to door through all villages, and you shall strike each door three times. And when people peer out, they will see you and fear your fate for themselves. Dance, red shoes, you shall dance. The girl begged for mercy, but before she could plead further, her red shoes carried her away. Over the briars she danced, through the streams, over the hedgerows, and on and on, dancing, still dancing, till she came to her old home and there were, mo there were mourners. The old woman who had taken her in had died. Yet even so, she danced on by, and danced she did, and danced she must, in abject exhaustion and horror. She danced into a forest where she lived the town's ex where forest where lived the town's executioner and the axe on his wall began to tremble as soon as it sensed her coming near please she begged the, ex the executioner as she danced by his doors please cut off my shoes to free me from this horrid fate 
and the executioner cut through the straps of the red shoes with his axe, but still the shoes stayed on her feet. And so she, she cried to him that her life was worth nothing and that he could sh should cut off her feet. So he cut off her feet. And the red shoes with the feet in them kept on dancing through the forest and over the hill and out of sight. And now the girl was a poor cripple and had to find her own way in the world as a servant to others. And she never, ever again wished for red shoes. Wow, okay. Well, that was the end of the story. A cautionary tale against the wild woman, I would say. Um, so then the book goes into examining the story and talking about how it talks about the wild woman. So I'm just gonna read the first portion of that so we can get a little bit of context for that brutal fairy tale. It is more than reasonable to ask why there are such brutal episodes in fairy tales. It is a phenomenon found worldwide in mythos and fol folklore. The gruesome conclusion to this tale is typical of fairy tale endings wherein the spiritual protagonist is unable to complete an attempted transformation. Psychologically, the brutal episode communicates an imperative psychic truth. This truth is so urgent and yet so easy to disregard by saying, oh, um, hmm, I do not understand, I do understand and to then go traipsing off to one's doom anyway, that we are unlikely to heed the alarm if it is stated in lesser terms. In the modern technological world, the brutal episodes of fairy tales have been replaced by images and television commercials, such as those showing a family snapshot with one member blotted out and a trail of blood over the photograph to show what happens when a person drives while drunk or attempting to dissuade people from using illegal drugs by showing an egg bubbling in a frying pan and pointing out this is what happens to the brain on drugs. The brutal motif is an ancient way of causing the emotive self to pay attention to a very serious message. message. The psychological truth in the red shoes is that a woman's meaningful life can be pried, threatened, robbed, and seduced away from her unless she holds on to or retrieves her basic joy and wild worth. The tale calls our attention to traps and poisons we too easily take onto ourselves when we are caught in a famine of wild soul. Without a firm participation with the wild nature, a woman, a woman starves and falls into an obsession of feel betters, leave me alones and love me, please. When she is starved, a woman will take away uh, will take any substitutes offered, including those that, like dead placebos, do absolutely nothing for her, as well as destructive and life-threatening ones that hideously waste her time and talents or expose her life to physical danger. It is a famine of the soul that makes a woman choose things that will cause her to dance madly out of control, then too, too near the executioner's door. So in order to understand this tale further, we have to see how a woman can so drastically lose her way by losing her instinctual and wild life. The way to hold on to what we have, the way to find our way back to the wild feminine is to see what mistakes a woman so trapped can make. Then we can backtrack and repair. Then we can have reunion. Um, then it goes on to say, as we shall see, the loss of the handmade red shoes represented, represents the loss of a woman's self-designed life and passionate vitality. Uh, the loss of the handmade red shoes represents the loss of a woman's self-designed life and passionate vitality and the taking on of a too tame life. This eventually leads to loss of accurate perception, which leads to excess, which leads to loss of the feet. The platform on which we stand, our basis, a deep part of our instinctual nature that supports our freedom. So I think that what she's trying to say and what the fairy tale is trying to say is the original red shoes that the girl had made herself 
represented her designed life, the wildish, um, the wildish nature. And when those were ripped away, she got convoluted and confused with the new red shoes because what the external of the red shoes wasn't the, the real meat of her life. It was just a facade or a distraction which took her in the wrong direction. So essentially talking about how Hi, baby. Hi. You're recording? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, sorry. And I'm just going to finish up because I don't want to edit this. Um, so Lucas just got home. But essentially how, as wild women, we can get, we can get distracted by society's values and what the real purpose of our wildish nature actually is and what our self-defined life is. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little video. I love you guys so, so much and I will see you next time. If you guys wanna, um, you want more of the wildish woman, little archetype fairy tale stories, just let me know. And don't forget to check out jacksyshop.com if you want this little shirt. Love you guys.